we're delighted to be joined by Leslie Pierce. Um, she's author of 28 global bestsellers. And um, tonight, Leslie is going to speak to us about her life, her writing journey, and her new best selling novel, Liar. Um, she's a great supporter of libraries, and um, we're really grateful we can continue with our author events in this new digital way. Um, so, without further ado, I'll pass over to Leslie. Well, it's lovely to be with you. People always ask me if I always wanted to be a writer and uh, the answer to that is no. But as a young girl, I was a great storyteller. I used to tell the most amazing stories while I was out in the playground. Um, of course, when I was a kid, it was called Lying. So it's quite appropriate that I've got a book out now called Liar. And I used to tell very far-fetched far stories, like I'd run away from home because my stepmother was cruel and I was sleeping under a hedge and all night. And nobody ever questioned why I had nice pressed hair ribbons or white socks um, if I had been there. And it, I kept that up for, for days and people even brought me in sandwiches and pieces of cake because I said I hadn't had anything to eat. But, you know, eventually one grows out of that and starts telling more plausible stories. I think on a, on a holiday in Belgium with the school, I pretended I'd fallen in love with someone called Jean-Pierre that I'd met while whilst away from the other girls. Unfortunately, that backfired on me because I had to keep, keep going out to meet him. So I couldn't go out with the girls and have fun with them. I had to go and meet this wretched imaginary man. But of course, so anyway, I lost interest in telling far-fetched stories and entered the world of work. Well, the youth employment officer at my school said she thought she could get me into one of the better branches of Woolworths. And my stepmother, who though she was usually down on me about everything, she actually said, oh, I think we can do better than that. So I was then asked what I wanted to do. And I said, I wanted to be a nurse. And my stepmother said, well, that's no good. You can't do that. You've got no sense of responsibility. But she said, you could be a nursery nurse. Um, obviously, you know, if you're in charge of children, you don't have to have any sense of responsibility at all. So that's what I went and did. And, uh, you know, the first family I worked for um, as a nanny, um, they were absolutely lovely. They had a country club down near Hastings and their little boy, Simon, was wonderful. And they had a, an older child who was, um, was the daughter of, oh God, I can't remember his name now. He was in Ring of Bright Water and Elsa, this story, but anyway, they were divorced. But it was really the little boy that I looked after most of the, mostly. And uh, they had quite a glamorous clientele there, which was a complete change for me from home. And I can remember the first day I was there, Mrs. Jackson and I worked for um, was a sort of gourmet cook. And bearing in mind, this was sort of early 1960s, you know, the most exotic thing people had had in those days was spaghetti bolognese. And most people hadn't even had that. I hadn't. But she was making something, rolling this stuff up. And I said, what's that? And she said, well, it's cannelloni. And it's got spinach and ham in it. And then it has cheese sauce. Well, I must have pulled a face. And she said, Leslie, just because you don't like the sound of it, don't let that put you off. Try it and see. So I did and loved it. But... I had been brought up with my stepmother putting the cabbage on at four o'clock in the afternoon and at seven she strained it and squashed it between two plates and then gave us a slice of it. So you can imagine the food in our house was pretty disgusting but she'd been a nurse in the army and she'd never really done a hundred things you can do with a pound of mince or any, or any cooking really at all. So she sort of had to pick it up as she went along and she picked it up very badly. So going to work for this family was an eye-opener in the culinary department and everything else. You know, it was also a beautiful house. And, and the visitors that came and stayed there were all quite intriguing. So it was a glimpse into another world. Later on, I went away and trained as a nursery nurse, but um, I didn't stick at it, nursery nursing really, mainly because the family I went to work for, which were so horrible that I put me off. And um, I ended up back in London at the time when London was just beginning to burst with all the excitement that came with the 60s and the later part of the 60s, the mini skirts and the boutiques and the rock concerts and all the rest of it. So, and I went into promotion work then, which 
I was ideally suited for because I was always a sort of rent a god, you know, I could always talk the hind legs off a donkey. So that was quite good. And one of the jobs I had at that time was a bunny in, in the Playboy Club. Um, I didn't actually want to go and work there, but a friend of mine persuaded me to go, for, go with her for an audition. And amazingly, they picked me, but not her, um, something which she's never let me forget. And, uh, but the thing was, I didn't really like it at the Bunny Club because it was actually much more hard work than it sounds. We, we had to do sort of eight hour shifts with four inch stilettos on. You weren't allowed to drink or anything like that. You couldn't really even talk to the people who stayed there, who came there. And they weren't the glamorous people like the Peter O'Toole's and Michael Caine's that had been going there. It was more your northern businessmen that were down on a jolly for the weekend. And they were all, to me, totally boring because they were over 40. And, you know, when you're in your 20s, 40 seems enormously old. But the good thing was when I left there that I got much better jobs and promotions because they just assumed I was glamorous. And I did my best to keep it up not always so successfully but i had two marriages that went wrong the first one hardly counts because i was only with him for about 18 months and i realized i'd made a terrible mistake and got out of it but the second marriage i married a musician he was a trumpet player he'd been with lulu and dusty springfield and he was a very charismatic but troubled character he's the father of my oldest daughter lucy and um he was the inspiration behind my first book, Georgia. But I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, then finally, I was on my way to Bristol for an interview for a job and I was hitch hitchhiking because I didn't have any money. And I got picked up at the services by Nigel Pierce, who I subsequently, two years later, married and had two more children with. And we were very happy for about 20 years. I don't really know what went wrong there, but it did in the end, but you know, that hardly matters really now. And it was during that time when the children were small that I suddenly started writing letters to the local paper. Um, I wrote a short story and I got that published and I began to think, well, maybe I could do this for a living. People had always said that they kept my letters and things because they were interesting. And people were always asking me to write letters for them. They had a difficult one to do. So, I suddenly got the idea that I'll write a book. And what really prompted it mostly was when my youngest daughter was born, I was feeding her one night, it was a sort of hot summer's evening, and I was reading the thorn birds. And the next thing I knew, it was morning, and I'd been there all night in this chair with the baby still in my arms, and I hadn't even noticed the time go past or anything. And as I put her back in her cot, fortunately she stayed asleep and I was walking down the stairs. I thought, I'm going to write a book like that, that keeps people gripped. Well, you're the best judge of whether I've managed to do that. But once I'd got this idea in my head, it would not go away. So I started writing and the first thing I wrote was basically autobiographical, a huge great tome with about 900 pages. And... Uh, I actually sent it to the Virago Press, not realising they were must have been very new then, and I didn't really understand what they were about. Hello, Rosie, I've just got a picture of you on the screen. Um, I didn't, yes, I didn't really know what Virago Press was, except that it sounded like me. I thought I was a bit of a Virago. Um, but they very kindly wrote back and said, no, this is no good for us, but you can write and you've got enough material there for three books. So, you know, keep on at it. And that actually just that little gem of encouragement was enough for me. So I wrote another two books after that. I might add that all three of those first books are in the dustbin. None of them have ever been published. But the last one, I sent part of it to an agent in London and he asked to see me. Well, I went off on the train thinking, well, this is it. Fame and fortune's beckoning. Jackie Collins had better watch out. I'm on, I'm on my way up. But halfway through the lunch with him, he pushed the manuscript back across the table. He said, this is absolute rubbish, Leslie. He said, I suggest you go home and write something about that you really know about. 
and but you can write so just do that so it was a very hot day in London that day and I had a train ticket that you couldn't get back on the train till seven o'clock and I sat on Paddington station feeling very very sorry for myself because I'd set off with such enthusiasm that morning thinking you know I was really there then but I started at that time I had a shop a gift shop in Bristol and I had a girl working for me called Georgia, a mixed race girl who I loved and still do and you know she's in her 50s now but she's still a close friend but she was only 19 then and she was a bit scatterbrained so I was thinking has she managed at the shop today on her own and blah 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 and then I started thinking about what did I know about that I could really write about and I thought I know the pop world because of the, the husband I'd had that was a musician I knew lots of sort of stuff that your average person doesn't know about well by the time I got to Bristol I had the whole idea for Georgia my first book in the in the thing and I used Georgia's face and character as the as the main character in it because she was such fun she was always waving her arms about and then she breaks something you know because things would get in her way but she she was honest reliable and just such fun to be with so she was the inspiration behind the character. Anyway, I used to tell her the story bit by bit every day, like a sort of running serial. And when I eventually finished, and it was enormous too, um, I sent it off to the agent in London. And he absolutely loved it, but then he couldn't sell it. And the reason was at that time was that at that particular time in the 80s, all the books that were really popular were the so-called sex and shopping books. Um, scruples and lace and things like that and that's what the publishers were looking for they didn't want sort of backstreet sex and you know poor musicians and you know that sort of thing um, they didn't even want a mixed race heroin you know so they were all turning it down and um, eventually the agent suggested that we just gave up on it but I didn't give up on it meanwhile I'd written another two books which were did become published later on um, but a, a neighbour of mine said to me, why don't you send it to Heinemann? Somebody I know or my mother knows has got a book published with them. Now, I knew that my agent didn't think much of this particular publishing company. He thought it was all sort of American pulp fiction. But I thought, well, it's better to be published by someone than nobody. So I packed it up and sent it off to them. Well, as luck would have it, that's when luck stepped through the door because this young woman had just come to Heinemann as a junior editor and she read it this dog-eared huge manuscript that day that she could see it done the rounds to loads of places and she absolutely loved it and she decided she'd buy it so it was the first book she'd ever bought and that lady is Louise Moore who's still she's you know very high up in Penguin Books now and still with me after all these years but she was about 24 at the time. I still think she's that age, but of course she's not. She's sort of in her 50s. But that's how it started. And uh, of course, it completely changed my life. Well, just as well, because at that time, my shop started to go down the pan. I had to go for a voluntary arrangement to close it all up. And uh, I was left with a lot of debt. At the same time, I left Nigel. And, um, you know, things were pretty awful at the time but the book was you know the fact I'd finally got the book published was was marvellous and uh, meanwhile Tara and Camellia that I had stashed away came along next well Camellia had to be rewritten and I put Ellie in front of it so it became a book and a sequel for that but that's sort of in a nutshell is how it happened and um well, shall I read you a bit from my new book, Liar? And for those of you that know nothing about Liar, this is very weird when you don't get anybody laughing or speaking back at you. So forgive me if I keep floundering. So the story about Liar is set during the 70s. And I was actually, my oldest daughter was born in the street that I wrote about in this. And when my old agent said, write about what you know, he's so right. As soon as you start writing about somewhere you've been or something you've done, it has a ring of truth that nothing else does. I mean, you can learn an enormous amount from research about things, which helps, but 
there is nothing quite as good as personal experience of something. But I hasten to add that what this girl finds around the corner to her house, I didn't find. So here we go. So this is Shepherd's Bush in 1970. The stink from the bags of rubbish piled against the wall in Scotts Road made Amelia involuntarily gag and cover her nose. The local dustbin men had gone on strike and the council appeared disinclined to make any alternative arrangement. People had resorted to piling their refuse on side roads like this one, anywhere, just as long as it wasn't outside their own home. Amelia lived just round the corner in Godolphin Road. It was a street of Victorian three-storey houses with basements. They'd been built as family homes with rooms for servants, but now practically all were in multiple occupation. The luckier tenants had a self-contained flat, but mostly the houses were divided into bed sitters with as many as te 10 rooms showing one bathroom. Amelia thought herself lucky. Her room on the first floor of number 22 was large and light, and there were two bathrooms in the house along with a separate lavatory, but then her landlord was a decent sort. He lived in the basement flat and kept an eye on his tenants. Pleasant he may be, yet his house was still shabby. Cracked lino in the hall, a threadbare stair carpet, and despite all the tenants getting on quite well, no one was in favour of a cleaning rotor. Mostly it was Amelia who cleaned the common parts. She daydreamed of having a real flat with a proper kitchen instead of a cupboard, and her own bathroom where she could arrange fluffy towels and pretty bottles of bubble bath. But on £12 a week from her job at the West London Weekly, she couldn't afford anything better. In the summertime, by Mungo Jerry had been in the top 20 for most of the summer. It wafted out of shops, houses and from car radios all the time. But while that song created a lovely image of sunshine and flowers, stinking piles of rubbish were growing all over London. Now in late August, this one in Scotts Road had become a small mountain. Mike, who lived in the bedsit next to Amelia, claimed he'd seen rats running around on it the previous night. He thought the army should be called in. Amelia usually averted her eyes from it and hurried past as fast as she could, but she saw something white out of the corner of her eye and turned her head to look. There on the rubbish was a pair of gorgeous white boots she'd seen a been aching to own. She'd seen an advertisement on the tube for them, a black girl with an Afro hairstyle, sitting naked on a rock wearing only the boots. A girl in the office called them Durex boots because the legs were tight, stretchy and quite difficult to get on. Amelia couldn't believe that anyone had just dumped them there. The soles looked hardly worn. Glancing round first to check no one was watching, she went closer, braving the smell. She couldn't see her size, but they looked like a five, her size. Checking around her once more, she climbed over a couple of bags and grabbed one of the boots. It didn't move, so she pulled it sharply. The rubbish bag shifted, and to her horror, she saw the boot was attached to a human leg. She screamed and almost toppled over backwards as she let go of it. On reaching the pavement, she saw the pile had collapsed further with the weight and now a tanned thigh was exposed. So there we go. That's the beginning of Liar. And she's a sort of junior reporter, so say, but not really doing much reporting, just selling advertising space for the local paper. But this becomes her breakthrough because she's the person who finds this girl that's been murdered. She gets her chance to write a story and so on. And, and I'm not going to tell you anymore, otherwise you won't want to buy it. And that's not what we're here for. But um, I've got a couple of questions here that people have, have asked. Anne asked, do I have a special place to write and do I write every day? Um, the special place to write to me is just my desk. I don't really write anywhere else. Um, I like all my stuff around me the dog under the under the desk and so on. I don't really write anywhere else at all. And do I write every day? Um, I used to, and I used to write nearly every night as well. But these days I'm more keen on doing my garden and doing almost anything other than writing. So I have to force myself to do it. Diane asked, um, where do I get your ideas from when you write? Do you hear conversations and get ideas from those and other sources? Um, I never really can say where ideas come from. They come to me out of nowhere. Um, I was once on the bus and I heard one woman say to the other, he had to have it off, you know. Something like, 
she meant like a leg or something like that. I spent all day thinking about that, thinking what could he have been taking off. So I suppose when you hear snippets of conversation like that, that does inspire you. Um, Catherine's asked, your book, You'll Never See Me Again, is set during the First World War and the Spanish flu impacts on the character's life in a significant way. How did you go about the research for it? And has it influenced your experience of our current situation? Well, a lot of people said that the, the title of that book, You'll Never See Me Again, and the fact it was about the Spanish flu was very prophetic. My, my publishers have found it quite amusing. Um, yeah, I've always been fascinated by unpleasant diseases, cholera particularly, and Spanish flu is quite fascinating. And yes, it was strange that I spent a long time researching all this and then suddenly we, we have this pandemic here. Um, I was more interested in the book though about the German prisoners of war because I never knew that in the First World War that we had German prisoners of war in this country. I, I suppose I just imagined that they were quietly shot somewhere because you don't hear people talking about them, do you, in the First World War? You do in the Second World War, people will say, or they drained the marshes at so-and-so, or they worked on the farms, but never for the First World War. But I discovered that there were 5,000 of them in, in the town of Dorchester. And I went there with a German friend of mine who actually stars in the book because he he um, bid at an auction to be a character in it. And he, he's got his real name in the book, Carsten. And he's a very dear friend now. So he came with me to Dorchester to investigate. And we found that there is the only memorial to the German prisoners of war who died in England. And they all died of Spanish flu. They weren't shot or anything like that. And it's in the churchyard there. And that was quite moving. The scouts have been looking after it for all those years, you know, even through the Second World War, where people became a bit nastier about Germans than they were in the First World War. But it was fascinating to find that the people of Dorchester really embraced these um, prisoners of war. A lot of them, because their men had gone off to fight and there was no one to look after the farms or anything, the Germans went and looked after their farms for them and worked in the gardens as well for people. And I just thought the whole thing was quite fascinating. And in fact, when these men died, they had a sort of full military funeral and, you know, people, the townsfolk would turn out to watch and there was no glee. And in fact, when they eventually went home and, and went back to Germany, people went to see them off, which is not quite what we imagine would happen with them in wartime, is it? But, you know, so there is no nothing better than really going into research properly and wandering around a town and imagining your characters being there and what they did and what they saw and that kind of thing. Um, we walked all around the river and we found the house where I said she lived um, during that time. And it, it became very real to me. And once it becomes real like that, it's really, the, the same lady, Catherine, thinks I live in Dorset but I don't, I live in Devon. But anyway, that doesn't matter. She's also asking me how things have changed in the publishing world since it started, for better or worse. Um, there isn't quite so much snobbishness in the publishing world. When I first got st started, anyone who wrote a commercial book like mine, that was considered a bit sort of, well, let's not talk about that too much. We'll talk about the literary books. But that's really silly because when I joined Penguin, Penguin was the huge Rolls Royce of a publishing house, which was running without any petrol. So myself and Marion Keyes and a couple of other writers were poached there to become the petrol to go in the old Rolls Royce. And I think at that point, everybody realized that, you know, you need commercial fiction just as much. And after all, most of us don't read literary books all the time. You know, we may read the odd one that's a bit more high flame, but the vast majority of people read commercial fiction. You know, we read Lee Child and we read Leslie Pierce. And other, uh, all these writers' names have gone out of my head. I'm sorry, but amnesia there. Now, what's the most bizarre request you've ever had over the years? 
in signings on publicity. Well, I can't think of anything bizarre there, but one of the most bizarre fan letters I ever had was from a chap in Seoul in Korea who had obviously read my book, Charity, and had got the idea that the pretty blonde girl that was on the cover was me. And he wrote and asked me if I would marry him. And he sent me, even sent me a bus timetable of how to get to his house. He didn't explain how I was going to get to Korea, but he did send me the bus timetable. So I sent him a more current picture of me with a bad hairdo and thanked him for his interest and pointed out that I wasn't the girl on the cover. And, but thanked him nicely anyway for his offer. I think that's the most bizarre one I've ever had. Now, um, this same person has also asked, have you ever spent lots of time on a research trip and then found the book you were going to write changed completely? It does sometimes, you, you know, sometimes you find out something when you're doing research that makes you go off in another direction. Um, characters also talk to you and they tell, they tell you things. When I was writing Never Look Back, which for those of you who haven't read it, is a story about wagon trains going across America back in the beginning when, you know, it was just getting, you know, people were first going to America. Um, the, the character in question, I intended her to get to San Francisco and open a brothel. I thought that would be great fun. But all the time we were going across America, I could almost hear her saying, no, 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 I don't do that. That's not my scene, you know. So in the end, when I got to San Francisco, I had to have her um, rescuing fallen, fallen women. So I didn't get my chance. But I always wanted to write a story about a brothel, which was why I wrote Belle. And I didn't listen to Belle at all. I was determined that that's what she was going to do. And I had a born in a brothel and the mother was the sort of brothel keeper and um, she didn't complain I mean she went along with it but I had her abducted and sold into a cat house in America but that was great because I finally got where I wanted to writing about something like that but um, my daughters were reading the book and um, there's one bit where Belle in the place in New Orleans where she's gone to she and the other girls are sort of dressed in their nice dresses for the evening and they're sitting in the garden drinking lemonade before they have to start work and one of my daughters had read this and she said oh I thought that sounded lovely she said I thought I wouldn't mind working in a place like that all dressed up and waiting for the excitement of the evening I thought what have I done I've given my idea my girls the idea that working in a brothel is a fun job so you know things can back come back on you in other ways and Another question here is, what surprises you about your characters as they develop? Do they often misbehave? Uh, yes. Um, like I said, the, you get this sort of thing where they don't want to do something or you feel that they're going in another direction. Um, and I've got to keep in my, in the back of my head the, the, the clear plan that I had when I started the book. And sometimes that's at odds with one another, if that makes any sense at all. Um, yes, I mean, at the moment, I'm writing a book about, uh, um, it's, at the moment, we're going to call it Malice. I don't know when that will be, we'll stay with it as the title. But it's about a close in Cheltenham, where 10, 10 houses in this close, and um, a young couple move in there, and on the day they move in, a child has been murdered the night before on the waste ground behind it. And everybody in that close is more or less under suspicion. And they've, you know, there's quite a few very odd characters in there. Now that's been quite good fun because there is a couple of people in there who I thought would be the baddies in the beginning. And I'm finding redeeming qualities in them so they can't be baddies. So we shall see how it goes. I've still got about a third of it left to write. So we shall see what happens with that. Well, um, I don't know if anybody else out there has got any more questions for me or anybody wants to ask me anything. Speak now or forever hold thy peace.
Um, I was going to um, ask everyone um, if they would, if they do have any questions, um, if they could write them in the chat bar, and we'll um, we'll put them to Leslie. Um, but I've, I've got one while I'm here. Um, so you're you're writing malice or what might be malice at the moment, and mm -hmm. so you've been writing that presumably during lockdown. Did you find it? easier or harder how have you found this year in terms of writing well in theory it should have been the easiest thing to do to be able to just hunker down and just write and write and write but in fact i found a million things to do that were more enthralling than actually writing you know cleaning out drawers doing the, mainly gardening of course we had lovely weather as well i always find it hard to write when the weather's nice i want to be outside um so my best time for writing is sort of January and February when it's grim outside. But um, I have battled on with this book because the publishers are quite keen to have it pretty soon. And, you know, they've been quite tolerant so far, but, you know, sometimes you just feel like you're struggling up a hill. I've, I'm waiting actually, they, I sent them 20 chapters yesterday for them to read and I'm still waiting for them to come back with their verdict on it. <laughs> it's always a bit I thought I might have heard by today but uh, I haven't so you know that's always a bit nerve-wracking um, this is from Simon he's asking me if I'm a plotter oh, plotting yeah. out a novel yeah I'll, I'll read out the question just in case everyone can't um mm. can't read the chat so um hi Leslie are you a plotter plotting out a novel in detail or are you a discovery writer waiting to see what your characters or where they take you? you no, know, I am a by the seat of my pants writer. You know, I just start writing and I carry on. And uh, common sense tells me that that's not a very good idea because sometimes you write loads of stuff and um, then it's no use because something happens. You know, you have a, a change of plan and... So I admire the people who do plot everything, but I can't seem to do it. The only thing I've ever done once was, which I thought was quite a cunning wheeze, when I was writing um, Never Look Back, the Wagon Dream book, I wrote what would be on the back of the book about, they said she never cried, but she did. She cried for this and she cried for that. And it was just a little bit about the main character. And that was great because I was, had a framework to go into you know, without being too specific. But I can't really see how, you know, you can enjoy writing when you've got everything down, like it's a diary of what you've got to put in on any particular day. So I shall carry on flying by the seat of my pants. <laughs> well, it obviously works, so. <laughs> um, and we've got another one from uh, Kat. Um, oh, I think this is a, a comment. There were a lot of German prisoners of war who died at Cannock Chase, so that's not too far from us here in Shropshire. Mm. And there's a war cemetery for them there. So, yeah. Is, there, is that the First World War, though? Um, ah, no, she didn't, didn't say whether it was First World no. War. Um, no. Well, you know, I, I did some... Of course, I, even if I'd heard that they were at Cannock okay, Chanuk Chase, I, that's a hard word to say, isn't it? <laughs> um, I probably wouldn't have, I would have chosen to go to Dorchester because it's more in my line mm. of thing. But yes, oh, they died from Spanish flu, yes. Mm. Well, I didn't know about them and thank you for that. But sorry, I didn't use those ones. So I've got the Dorset mob. Mm. <laughs> well, when it's closer to you. It's... Mm. Um, so... Uh... So Joe, Joe has asked, um, you mentioned letter writing. Um, it is quite the art form, um, but do you feel that's been lost in these digital times? Well, it hasn't been lost to me because I still write letters to people, mainly because people insist on having one, you know, and they say um, a couple of, uh, two years ago, I wrote to everybody at Christmas. I did a sort of round robin and I said, I'm not going to send any more Christmas cards. I'm going to give the money to charity. So let me have your email addresses and I'll still send you an email as I normally did. And some people were quite cross about that because I'd always enclosed a proper letter inside. It might have been 
a mass produced letter, but it was something to unfold and everything. And I think people like the idea of opening this and then they've got all that information. But if you can imagine when you write all year, the last thing you really want to do is write to 400 or so people <laughs> a letter at Christmas. And you know, the, the, the whole Christmas card thing has got out of control for most of us, hasn't it? You know, that we all think we should do it. And then I think it's better to give it to the homeless or, you know, di Christmas dinners for people who really need them than, you know, sending something that's just going to end up in the dustbin. I, my exception to that is if I know someone's old and they're on their own and that kind of thing. And it's probably, um, you know, they really value having Christmas cards sitting around. Yeah. Uh, there was a lovely um, um, poem by the man that wrote Winnie the Pooh, A.A. Milne, about King John. King John was not a good man. He had his little ways. And sometimes no one spoke to him for days and days and days. And every year at Christmas, the cards upon the shelf were never from his near and dear, but only from himself. <laughs> and it goes on to what happened afterwards. But it's funny how you can remember stuff like that. and You can't remember stuff that you've been told five minutes ago. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that I always think that that's quite true, though. You know, the, there are people that like to have their cards on the mantelpiece. I don't because they fall off. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on, yeah, depends on your furniture. <laughs> um, and we've got one from Stephen, which said, would you, if you were starting out now, go through an agent? Yes, you need to go through an agent. Um, there are people who think, well, why should I pay the agent's fees, the sort of 17 and a half percent of what you earn? But you probably wouldn't have had any earnings if you hadn't gone through them because they can do the deal for you. They know the right people to approach and they look after your interests right the way along the line. So, um, you know, that uh, every contract, I mean, you know, just this week I've had two foreign countries have, have bought rights. An agent looks into that you're getting the fair share, that the, the kind of money you should be getting for that. And that it's all done properly and that kind of thing. Um, I think most people, before they write, they think, well, I'm not sharing the money with anybody else. But it is, it's like people who want to self publish. That's all very well and good. If you can, you know, you can do it far enough. It's sending that book out into all the shops and getting it in there. It's far better to leave, leave the publish, let the publishers deal with all that kind of stuff because that's their job. That's my opinion anyway leaves you time to get on with the writing mm, exactly <laughs> yes um uh, one from jackie um which novelist do you like to read in your free time my favorite book this summer has been um the beekeeper of aleppo and also i can't remember the type the name of the person that wrote it and Where the Crawdads Sing is another wonderful one that I read this summer. Um, I'm, t I'm terrible at, particularly when you've got it on the Kindle, that there's nothing to remind you of the author's name, or that there's no blurb like on the back of a book to remind you about stuff. So forgive me if I can't tell you the author's names. But both of those two books I would thoroughly recommend. I read across the board, though, because um, publishers are always sending me books, particularly first novels from people, and they want me to say something about it, preferably, you know, something nice. nice. <laughs> I, I have never, ever said anything nasty about a book. I, I sometimes say, well, it's not quite my thing, because rather than be completely dishonest when I think it's really awful. But... Um, so yes so i've always got books appearing in the door so sometimes you can't actually read what you want to read i'm reading one at the moment that's uh, going to be out i've just read the the glorious guinness girls which is out in a couple of weeks time that's uh, that that was quite good about the, the guinness family oh. um and then uh, another one from joe uh does the narrator change novel to novel? Um, is it Leslie Pierce narrating or a character with a certain point of view themselves? Um, no, I, I, Leslie Pierce never narrates it. It's always the characters that 
do the talking in it, not me. Not you. Yeah. So, yeah. I've noticed a lot recently that a tremendous amount of books are a buck from the narrator, you know, from the person who wrote it. Um, and I think it might be quite a good way, but then you can only give one point of view. You know, if you're narrating it, you can only talk about what you're seeing. I like having all the characters and they've all got their points of view. Okay. If that makes any sense hmm. at all. Um, just Heather, uh, one of our library staff, has said, um, Where the Crawdads Sing is uh, by Delilah Owens and The Beekeeper of Aleppo is Christy Lefteri. Lefteri? I don't know how you pronounce that either, which is why I didn't, I did know, that I didn't <laughs> but I couldn't say it. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure both of those will be available through yeah. Shopper Libraries. Should both, both of them are still in the top 20, actually, and rightly so. They're two outstanding books. Yeah, so. Oh, well, always great to have recommendations. It is. Um, I wish people would recommend books to me. You know, they don't always. I think people think that I know know all about what's going on but you don't <laughs> you know not always you know actually when a friend says oh you'd love this you know that's that's good enough for me um how do you feel about publishing direct to kindle well they're about to do it for me in america so if i talk to you next year i'll tell you where, how i feel about it oh, okay. um, yes well I haven't had any luck with being published in America. The Americans always say I'm too English, which I think is the most balmy excuse I've ever heard. The she who was brought up on American children's classics like Tom Sawyer and Anne of Green Gables and things like that, and I knew what the Mississippi looked like. When I eventually got there, it was exactly as I imagined because it had been so well written. So I think that's a stupid assumption that American women can't cope with English books set in England. I mean, it's totally ludicrous, isn't it? I mean, they watch Downton Abbey, for goodness sake, on the television, and they seem to gra grasp that. So mm -hmm. why would a book be different? But so anyway, this young thrusting sort of company have come on that wants to take on six of my books and do them in America and Kindle. So I, that's going to start any minute now. So um, there'll be one a month for six months. So we shall see what happens out of it. So yeah, new times. Yes. I mean, I have I've used to think that Kindle was the best thing since sliced bread. When I first got mine, I thought, this is brilliant. You can have a whole load of books. You'll never run out of books and everything. But my complaint about them is the fact that you've got nothing to look at and grab. And when you're my age, you know, you need to pick up a book and be able to look at the back and read the back. Oh, yes, that's what that was about. Yes, I remember now. I'm with it. Because I sometimes open my Kindle at night time and it is handy when you're in bed with the light and all that on it. And I think, I can't even remember what I read last night. But if you've got a cover in front of you, for some reason or other, that stimulates the brain mm -hmm. into saying, oh yes, it was about that girl that's up in Scotland and is run away and was a singer, which is a book I'm reading about at the moment. She was a singer, but her vocal cords have gone. And so she's gone back to Scotland with a baby. Um, and, you know, that it, it needs something. I just think that they ought to tweak the Kindles in some way. So there's some something so we see it. Because you don't even get a proper cover, of, um, except for the bit where you first go into your library, do you? You see the cover there. But that's it. You don't see it again. I haven't got one, so I'm not sure. <laughs> um, yeah. But yes, yeah, I think having just seeing the uh, the image on a book just keeps keeps it in your mind. Then, yeah, I can see how that would be, yeah. especially if you're reading at night for me. Yes. Um, <laughs> so um, there was another one. Yes, there were two messages. Um, An Anko's one was quite interesting. Um, so I'm not familiar with your writing. What genre have you chosen, and how did you choose it? I've never chosen a genre and I don't actually have one and anyone who delves into my books will find it. Some of them are thrillers, some of them are family sagas, some you know they're all kinds of things um, 
basically adventure books for grown-ups, I think. Um, uh, in the beginning, it went against me that I didn't have a genre, but I hate it when people say, oh, you write romantic fiction, because I don't call it romantic fiction at all. But, you know, you have to suck it and see, I think, is the answer. <laughs> Try reading one and see what you think. And then um, we had one, would you ever write a book of poems or a different genre? Well, we've just said you do lots of different Yes. Poems. No, poems, no, because I'm absolute rubbish at it. <laughs> I have tried. <laughs> I'll leave that to someone who's got that kind of a mind. I can do limericks, but they're always rude, so sorry about <laughs> that. <laughs> I will read limerick every now and again. <laughs> Um, and then we've got uh, one from Joe. Uh, Leslie has been published in countless countries. How closely do you work with a translator? I don't work with them at all. Ah, right, okay. And unfortunately, unless, you know, you know someone who speaks Lithuanian, who's also read it in English, how are you ever going to know whether it's good or bad, you know? Um, my friend Carson, the one I said about earlier on, that's the character in the last book, um, he's he reads my books in english but his family read them in german and he says he's looked at them in german and he thinks that they're pretty well they're done really well that they're faithful to it because of course german's such a big language that you wonder how they can squeeze it down you know um, especially the earlier books they wouldn't publish me in germany for a long time because the books were too big you know some some of my early books are 900 pages so that would be twice as many you know so the answer to that is i haven't a clue <laughs> no <laughs> trust yeah trust the translations yeah um uh, got one from mika do you have a favorite book or books oh well it is too many to choose from <laughs> too many to choose from but my favorite all-time cheer me up book is cold comfort farm by stella gibbons i read it first when i was 16 and it's absolutely hysterical and I identify completely with Flora Post, the heroine of it, who's a very bossy woman who goes around sorting people's lives out. And the whole idea about someone living in Cold Comfort Farm and howling in Sussex. And they have this pe people like the quiver Quivering Brethren in church and things like that. It is just such a funny book. And every now and again, I reread it. It's, I don't think it's ever been out of print. I would thoroughly recommend everybody. You can read it in an afternoon. It's not terribly big. And uh, she never wrote anything again after that. It was a huge success in the 30s. And it's funny that there aren't many books that were written back then that are still popular with so many people now. You know, And that's one that I always judge people's reading matter by whether they read it or not. <laughs> and um, yeah, so... I think I've talked a lot of people into reading it that do because it's good fun, you know. Well, they made a film of it a little while ago. Kate Beckinsale played Flora Post. Ah. So you can cheat and watch the video if you can find <laughs> it on Netflix, but it, it's not as good as the book. No, all those little, yes, it's one of our um, reading group sets. Um, I know that. So, um, Is it? Oh, good. It. Well, yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. It really divided our group but yeah it is very really? yes yeah. yes i think it's hysterical um yeah big business the bull and all that yeah <laughs> yeah um i also am a great fan of dickens and i was born in rochester where of course he lived for years as well and my stepmother used to take me up to gads hill where his house was and show me and i i've always felt that there was some sort of weird guide in my life a spirit guide if you like um so I just admire his work so much. I think it's brilliant. Oh. Um, and then we've got uh, another one from Anko. Oh, no, maybe from Larry this time. Um, how do you settle on an idea from, uh, from many on what to actually progress to a book and then what preliminary steps do you take? I lay on the city, <laughs> close my eyes and dwell on the thought for several hours. And... Um, or stare out the window. Yeah, there's an awful lot of staring out the window goes on when I first got an idea for a book. Um, if the idea won't, doesn't seem to got any legs, I usually abandon it, you know. I, and I sometimes do a sort of diagram, 
roughly with a the, the middle part like a spider's web if you like and where this could take you and where that could take you um but the laying on the settee works best <laughs> right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. um i had uh, one more question um so you went uh, to america to the the trip to san francisco what's your favorite place been to set a novel and did you go there to do the research? Um, well I've been to Australia, to America, to Brazil, to Alaska. Alaska I think I would say was the favourite place and my book was called Gypsy that was set in the gold rush in, in Klondike and that is a spectacular country you you'd have to see it to believe it and the whole story about what those people went through looking for gold is just amazing. You know, that um, for photography was in its infancy then, but I have got a book of photographs that were taken by somebody at the time. And you see these young men all having their photographs taken in Skagway where there's st setting off up and they're all posing in front of the camera with their guns and all their equipment. And then there are pictures later on of the same group of men coming back after two years. And they were 18, 19 when they went. And they look like they're 40. They've been through so much, their faces are lined. And of course, disappointment. So few of them actually made any, any got any gold. And um, they might have had a bloody good time. But, you know, I think most of them, you know, that what was Frostbite and all the other things that went. So, yes, Alaska's got to be the number one uh, i'd like to thank leslie special thanks to leslie and um, for joining us tonight it's been um it's been fascinating to see um into a author's life especially a life like yours all that yeah all that london 60s it you know sounds fascinating <laughs> um so thank you for a delightful evening and um, thanks everyone else for joining us tonight well thank you for all these lovely little messages that are coming up and i've yeah, really no, enjoyed it lovely. And I'm going to have to come to Shropshire and find out, do some research up there, look for oh, some indeed, yes. gruesome story. Then I'm <laughs> sure it would be a good, good place for a gruesome story. Oh, we've got lots of murder mystery that we can especially... Well, share. Debbie, make sure you get one of the books out of the library. <laughs> so I'm gunning for you. 